Hi, welcome to Outside Ourselves, a podcast featuring conversations that remind us faith isn't something we do, it's something we receive. I'm Kelsey Clumbera. Outside Ourselves is a 1517 podcast. To learn more about all of our podcasts, please go to 1517.org forward slash podcasts. Did you know that the most widely used ecumenical creed in the entire world is the Nicene Creed? I didn't know this until I read Dr. Philip Carey's newest book, The Nicene Creed, an introduction. Dr. Carey is joining us for this episode to discuss that book. We also talk a little bit about his lifelong work with St. Augustine and Martin Luther and his love of both philosophy and theology. Even if you don't know anything about The Nicene Creed, I really think this episode has something for everyone. It's a really fun conversation. I enjoyed getting to know Dr. Carey just a little bit, and uh, I think that you will too. A note about today's recording before you start watching or listening. The recording software that I have used to record myself and my guests had some trouble on their back end. They lost my recording. Uh, they were able, fortunately, to recover a low-res version of of that recording. So you might notice that my audio and my video is of a little bit lesser quality than normal. I really hope that that doesn't detract you from listening or watching uh, this interview with Dr. Carey. Like I said, it's a very fun conversation, one of my favorites to date. So with that, here's the episode. I'm so, so thankful that you're joining me today. We were talking a little bit before we hit record, but I've been a big fan of yours for a long time. So I'm excited to pick your brain and also hear about this, this new book that you're coming out with in a couple months, right? Oh, well, the, the, the new book is, is now in existence. It's been printed. It's arrived from overseas where they have paper because there was a paper shortage that delayed it, but it, it, it now exists. So. Okay, good. Yeah. There it is. Nicene Creed. It's a very pretty book. It is. Uh, I don't know if you follow much social media, but on Twitter, people have been um, freaking out about the design of the book. Oh, really? Everyone loves it. Yeah. Well, I love it. I'm glad that other people do too. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. There's been a little bit of talk about it. So yeah. um, before we get started, before we dive into the Nicene Creed, can you give give us just a little bit about who you are, what you do, all that kind of stuff? Well, yes. So I'm a philosophy professor at Eastern University, which is outside Philadelphia. And um, I cheat and do a whole lot of theology, including um, I'm editor of a theology journal, Pro Ecclesia, which is um, subtitled A Journal of Catholic and Evangelical Theology, small c, small e, um, as in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and which is right in the creed, and evangelical as in gospel. Uh, so I, I'm, I edit theology. I write books that probably count half as theology and half as philosophy. I teach philosophy. That's my day job. Um, and I have been working mainly on Augustine and Luther as my, you know, the two theologians that I, or well, theologians. Augustine's a philosopher as well as a theologian. Luther is just a theologian. Uh, Luther is probably my favorite theologian of the tradition and That's what I've been working on, really, those two figures for the past 30 years of my life. Yeah, That's amazing. Um, Yeah, I was going to ask you, you are a, as you mentioned, you're a philosophy professor, Mm -hmm. but really most of the writing I've seen from you is theological, like you said, maybe a little bit philosophical. Um, How did you, what is your background? How did you kind of start to mirror those things and how have you found that they work together or maybe work against each other sometimes? Oh, yeah. So I, I went to graduate school, you know, in philosophy and okay. I was at Yale and I discovered that there's a bunch of theologians there that um, I could study with. Um, one of the few places in the in the country where I felt com- comfortable studying the theology as yeah. well as philosophy. And one of the teachers there is George Lindbeck, who's a Lutheran. Okay. Yeah. And um, so I, I ended up studying philosophy and theology in one place, and I had to write a dissertation that was on philosophy and theology at the same time. So I looked around for, for people I could write about, and that, w- 
that was going to be Augustine, who's mm. who really is both a philosopher and a theologian, but he's also the most influential Christian writer in the Western t- Christian tradition outside of the Bible yeah. itself. Mm-hmm. So um, that um, that led me to be writing about Augustine, but it also meant that I knew something about the whole way the Augustinian tradition from Augustine sort of unfolded beginning uh, in, in the fifth century AD and all the way up to Aquinas and Luther and Calvin and John Wesley. And so I've been able to study theology for the past 30 years um, because philosophical concepts do play a role in theology, inevitably, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. The New Testament's written in Greek, for heaven's sakes. Um, mm-hmm. St. Paul probably read a little bit of Plato, right? Mm-hmm. Some there, there are about three or four verses in the New Testament that sound a lot like Plato. Um, yeah. And then you discover that that Paul was actually talking about Christ. So he'll, he'll, he'll steal language from Plato and talk about Christ. Uh, Augustine steals a lot more language from the, the, the philosophical tradition and talks about Christ. Um, Aquinas steals even more. Luther says, oh, don't, don't listen to the philosophers quite so much, right? So right. this interaction between philosophy and theology has been part of the heartbeat of the Christian tradition ever since the New Testament. And so yeah. that gives somebody like me a whole lot to think about and, and write about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's, um, I, I don't know. I think philosophy is, is helpful in sometimes helping us categorize mm-hmm. the, theology or organize it in a way yep. that makes it easier to understand. But I know, you know, people in my camp sometimes are like, be careful. You don't want to press those, those categories um, or that organization down on scripture in a way where it's not there. So we have to be careful about that. Um, Have you found that to be the case? Yeah. um, I mean, the way to think of philosophy, uh, one way that that I think it's very helpful is something that Augustine says. It's it's like um, taking the gold from the Egyptians. You remember when when the Israelites left Egypt, they, they, um, they, they left with a lot of gold that belonged to the Egyptians. Like, yeah. And then that gold became part of the, the tabernacle and then part of the yeah. temple, right? So um, go ahead and, and grab some of the gold from the philosophers, right? Yeah. There's some gold there, right? There's also some dross. Uh, we'll mm. Stick with the gold. And that requires some discernment. Um, it also requires some awareness of how philosophical concepts do get into the Christian tradition, so that you can be yeah. critical of the, of the way they function there. Because, yeah, so for instance, let me give a, a, an example. Um, most Christians in the past 2000 years have believed in the immortality of the soul, that the soul mm-hmm. survives after, after the death of the body. Mm-hmm. Now, the immortality of the soul is a phrase that does not appear in scripture. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a concept that Plato talked a lot about, the great Greek philosopher. Um, and Christians can believe in that concept. In fact, there might be good reasons to believe in that concept from a Christian standpoint. But it's not the gospel. Yeah. The gospel is the resurrection of the body through right. the power of the Holy Spirit exercised through the body of Christ. So when, you know, when a bunch of, of disciples go to an empty tomb, they don't hear an angel say, oh, there's his body in the tomb. His soul went to heaven. No, it's he's not there anymore. Right. He's not there. Why are you looking for the living among the dead among the dead? He is risen. That is to say, he's not dead anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not like his soul and body are separated and his soul went to heaven. He is a living human being, body and soul. That's the gospel. Now, it may also be true that between the time of our death and the time of our resurrection, we live as immortal souls in God's sight in heaven. Probably the majority of the Christian tradition believes that. And it might even be true, but it's not the gospel, right? Yeah. And we need to know what the gospel and the good news is. That's the stuff that's centered on Easter. Yeah. 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 And you you, you said something um, that it's important to understand where those philosophical categories, where they enter into right. the Christian faith. Are you? Do you think the main way to do that is through knowing Christian history? Yeah. Um, a little bit better because that's I think that's a thing that we're and I think we'll get into this in a little bit but I think that's a thing we're struggling with right now is that mm-hmm. we just don't know our history very well right. um, is that the main way to kind of know that or is there different ways well yeah there's no there's no substitute for study right there's yeah. no substitute for yeah. learning and 
um, the crucial thing to learn is, first of all, Holy Scripture, and mm -hmm. second of all, the history of Christian thought and the Christian yeah. tradition. Because the Holy Spirit has not abandoned the Christian church, which is the body of Christ, over the past 2,000 years. Um, the Holy Spirit has been our teacher about how to read scripture for 2,000 years. Yeah. And that means there's something to learn about how to read scripture from Augustine and from yeah. Thomas Aquinas and from yeah. Luther and from Calvin. Um, it, it requires discernment, right? But but one cannot read well without this company of the faithful, this cloud of witnesses who are helping us read better. And that yeah. requires study and sometimes, you know, in certain historical circumstances, there's a kind of forgetfulness. We forget mm. what we what we should have learned from Luther, or we forget what we should have learned from Augustine. And recovering what these teachers have to teach us is going to be very, very healthy for our spiritual lives and for our, our life in, in the body of Christ. Yeah, I like the way you said that. I want to ask you really quickly before we move to the Nicene Creed, mm -hmm. um, why, why is Luther your favorite theologian? Uh -huh. Yeah, I think Luther's way of distinguishing law and gospel yeah. is just enormously valuable. Um, I've heard preachers who do it without even knowing about law and gospel. You don't actually have mm -hmm. to be Lutheran to get it. And right. some people get it in their bones. Yeah. But then others will talk about law and gospel and don't get it. And mm -hmm. I think the way to distinguish it is that um, the law is what tells us what to do. And the mm -hmm. gospel tells us what Christ does. Yeah. That's how Luther puts it in one of his little treatises on how to how Christians should regard Moses, I think, is the little treatise he, he writes that, there. And it's, it's really very simple. The law tells you what to do. Therefore, it can't save you because you can't save yourself by what you do. The gospel tells you what Christ does. Therefore, mm -hmm. it's good news. It is joyous. It's it, believing that is what saves you because it's taking hold of Christ through the story of how, who Christ is. Um, so that distinction i think is is really important for preachers to know and for yeah. ordinary christians to take hold of right what changes me from the inside out is not my efforts to be, be a good christian or sanctify myself or something what changes me from the inside out is the good news about who jesus christ is that's the gospel and it's summarized beautifully in the creed hmm. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, I, and that that distinction is in scripture. Mm -hmm. Luther is just the one one of the the people who was able to identify it and describe it so so yeah. clearly and helpfully. And, and after all, there's times when God tells us what to do. He does make commandments. Yeah, yeah. But then there's times yeah. that God says, um, "You will be my people, and I will be your God." That's a promise. Yes. It's like a wedding vow, right? Yes. Take hold of that yeah. kind of promise, right? Um, yeah. And to know that that's the thing to to cling to rather than our efforts to obey God's law, which always fall, fall short, right? We should make that effort. God's law is important, but w our efforts will always fall short. We got to get used to that idea and, and cling to the gospel, which is the story about who Jesus is and his promises. Yeah, very good. Uh, is that something you would say you kind of discovered in studying Luther or is it something mm -hmm. you that was instilled in you. Um, I'm just always curious to ask oh, yeah. people how they discovered law and gospel. I got to that, I think, from an unusual angle because um, uh, I didn't grow up Lutheran. And in fact, I'm not Lutheran. Um, yeah. What happened is a, a, a certain philosophical thought got me there. Okay. I was working on the philosophical question of how we know other persons. How do we learn okay. who another person is? And I was thinking, you don't really know who another person is just by observing them, unless they're a dishonest person. <laughs> but an honest person, a good person, you have to listen to them, right? Mm. Uh, you have to listen to what they, including how they promise themselves to you. That, that's how a, wed, um, a, a marriage works, right? Yeah. Husband mm -hmm. and wife give themselves to each other through their promises. So people can make themselves known through their words. Mm. And Sometimes you have to see through their words because they're lying. Right. But with a good person, you really can't know who they are unless you let their word into your heart and believe it. Hmm. So I think that's, you know, that's how we know God. God's yeah. word comes to us and, and faith takes it in through our ears into our hearts. Yeah. Um, because God, like every good person, 
has a right to a say about who he is. And he, st- mm-hmm. he does tell us who he is. So good people can give themselves to us through their words and promises. And that's an image of how God gives himself to us through his word, which is the gospel. And so I was writing philosoph- uh, philosophy about knowing other persons by believing their words. And when I started studying theology seriously in, in graduate school for the first time, really seriously studying theology, it was Luther who got that. Luther, yeah. I think, just gets that. Um, mm-hmm. Luther is a word person, right? It's all about hearing the word of God for Luther. Yes. And yep. the power of God comes to us through words. Mm-hmm. You know, some people think that words are just words and they don't matter. Luther doesn't think that. Words right. change everything. And God's yeah. word changes everything. Because through God's word, God gives us nothing less than his own beloved son, which is God incarnate, which is God in person. God gives himself through his words. Luther gets that. And I just love that. So that yeah. that's how I got to, to that point. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, there's uh, one, one for philosophy and, yeah, and on yeah, the side yeah. of getting you to a theological truth. So yeah. I'm all for that. That's great. Well, let's get into the book. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, I mean, the book is called the Nicene Creed, an introduction. Right. Uh, why did you choose to write this book? Ah, uh-huh. well, um, it started because um, of uh, Lexham Press, which you you probably know a bit about. And there's mm-hmm. an editor there named Todd Haynes. Yeah, who's... and he was on the show of, of last month. So. Yeah, he's a he's a good yeah, guy. He's great. And, um, yep. uh, you got to watch out though, because if you're a scholar, he might grab you and, and try to make you write books for him. Um, <laughs> which is what he did with me. Uh, he wanted okay. me to write a book about how the Christian life follows from the gospel. He said, "Phil, you you, you need to write a book about gospel ethics." where ethics is not about just the law, but about the gospel, right? And I think, yeah, that's right. That's how it's got to be done. That's how Luther did it. Um, But you know, Todd, um, you've got all these books at Lexham Press about the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments, but you don't have a book about the Nicene Creed. You need a book about the Nicene Creed, (laughs) right? I have been teaching my students about the Nicene Creed the first day of the semester for years now. I'm ready to write this little book on the Nicene Creed. What do you say? I do that one first, okay? And and he agreed. And so that's why this book has come out. And gospel ethics will will be another few years before it comes out. Okay. Um, Why do you start your philosophy classes with the Nicene Creed? I'm really interested in that. Well, um, actually, that's a class that's not philosophy, but Western Civ. So I I teach a Western Civ class. And what ends up happening is these are this is at a Christian university, so these yeah. are mostly Christian students, and we start with with Plato and Sophocles and Socrates, uh, and I figure okay you know the the Bible right, but we're going to talk about how Plato and Aristotle and these people uh, have been taken up into the Christian tradition, right? Because Christians read Plato and Augustine mm-hmm. especially reads the Platonist tradition, but the way that Christians take up philosophy and transform it is visible most clearly in the Nicene Creed. Mm. Because the Nicene Creed assumes some truths about God that the philosophers help you understand. Like, what does it mean to say God is timelessly eternal? That mm. that he's outside of space and time, right? Yeah. That kind of language, I think, follows from the Bible, but it's highly abstract and conceptual, and some of the philosophers can help you deal with that. And so the Nicene Creed, I think, actually assumes some of that truth about God being outside of space and time because he created it. Mm-hmm. But then it adds something that the philosophers would never have guessed, which is that God, God's son descends and becomes flesh and, and is born of a virgin and dies on a cross and is raised from the dead. That's mm-hmm. stuff that you're never going to get in a philosopher unless he's a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what, what you've got, I think, in the Nicene Creed is the great reckoning of the Christian tradition with Greek philosophy and and the philosophical tradition. Um, Okay. Right. We can, we can learn from the philosophers, but they don't know about Jesus. They don't know who Jesus really is. That's what the creed is about. Okay. Interesting. Um, Could you tell us a little bit for those who are like, what's the Nicene Creed Uh, or I've heard of it, but don't know much. uh, What, what is the creed? What's the historical background? How did it kind of come to be? Right. The Nicene Creed is the is a confession of faith, like every creed. 
it is the most widely used confession of faith in the whole world. Uh, mm -hmm. Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholics, and a good many Protestants will say it every Sunday, mm -hmm. um, especially in the connection with the, the Eucharist or communion. Yeah. It's a younger creed than the Apostles' Creed, which doesn't actually come from the Apostles, um, but probably arose in Rome in the third century, maybe. Uh, the Nicene Creed arises in, um, well, in Nicaea, which is uh, about 50 miles from Constantinople. It arises early in the fourth century. Mm -hmm. And it's different from the Apostles' Creed uh, because the Apostles' Creed was originally uh, recited at baptism. It was a baptismal creed. It's, it's okay. how you confess your faith when you're about to be baptized. And that's still true in a lot of churches. When mm -hmm. you're getting baptized, you'll recite the Apostles' Creed. Uh, or if infants are being baptized, the, the, the godparents will recite the Apostles' Creed. Whereas the Nicene Creed, which is what my book is about, comes about a century or two later. And it was um, uh, composed based probably on some local baptismal creed, but it was composed by a council of bishops because they had a heretic to deal with. Um, yeah. A heretic who basically was saying, oh yeah, Jesus, yeah, he's God, but not really like God the Father, right? You can't say that he's God the same way God the Father is, right? He's a little bit lower down on the scale, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And the people, um, the bishops at this council in Nicaea in 325 said, no way, right? He is as truly God as God the Father. And that's yeah. what the Nicene Creed is about, is to confess that, that Jesus really is as truly God as God the Father. Then all that other stuff, like being born of the Virgin Mary, being crucified, dead and buried, is true of God, who is just as truly God as God the Father. And that's the mm -hmm. radical claim of the Nicene Creed. Yeah. Okay. And the heretic they were dealing with is Arius. Is that Arius is correct? Name, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's that's helpful. I actually didn't know until I read your intro that it's the most widely used confession yeah. of the Christian faith. I, I think I would have assumed it was the Apostles' Creed, mm -hmm. um, not the Nicene Creed. So that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. It, it really defines orthodoxy, small o, for mm -hmm. the Eastern Orthodox, capital O, for Roman Catholics, capital C, and for um, a good many Protestants, Lutherans um, and yeah. Anglicans and such. Uh, so, so put that together and you've got more than a billion Christians who are saying yeah. it pretty much every Sunday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, you talk in the intro as well that it's a book mostly of words or vocabulary. Uh, yeah. Can you talk? Can you talk a little bit about um, what this means and why vocabulary is important in right. theology in particular? Right. So um, there's a lot of vocabulary. Well, nearly all of the vocabulary in the Nicene Creed comes straight out of the Bible. There's one really important yeah. exception, but even some of the biblical vocabulary is now unfamiliar to us. So, for yes. instance, um, the the Nicene Creed says that Jesus Christ is begotten from the Father before all ages, and sometimes that's translated eternally begotten, and that's that's a good translation too. Although literally, it's before all ages, and people read that, or my students will encounter it and say, "Begotten? That sounds weird. Mm. What's that?" Right? Yeah. <laughs> and that turns out to be an ordinary English word translating an ordinary Greek word that basically means this is how a father uh, produces a child. Mm. A father begets a child, a mother conceives a child, the child is born. So uh, roosters and stallions uh, do, do beget their, their colts and, yeah. and chicks, right? It's mm -hmm. an ordinary biological term. Mm -hmm. And it, it used to be fairly common. So in the King James Bible, you'll have Abraham begat Isaac, mm. which is to say Isaac is begotten from Abraham and Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob is begotten from Isaac. Right. Um, so it's an ordinary word. But then it's applied to the relationship between God, the father and God, the son. Mm. And that's not ordinary. Right. Yeah. Because there's no right. there's no mother involved. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no time involved. Mm. So and so this is all packed into the creed, right? So um, an ordinary father like myself, I have begotten two sons right, mm -hmm. in the ordinary biological sense. And I mm -hmm. existed long before my sons did. Mm 
Now, did God the Father exist before the Son so that there was a time when he wasn't a father? The way, it, you know, mm-hmm. I, was, I wasn't a father for about uh, 25 years. Right. But was there a time when the Father did not have a son? No. The folks at Nicaea said, no, the Father yeah. has always been Father. He's mm-hmm. always had a son. So the Son is eternally begotten before all time and all ages. The Son of God has always existed because he's just as truly God as God the Father. Sort of like my son is just as truly human as I am. But Mm -hmm. my beginning of my son happened in time. And there was once when my son did not exist. But if you say there was once when the son of God did not exist, that's a heresy. That's the heresy of Arius. He said, okay, the father begot the son. That's great. That meant that before the father begot the son, the son didn't exist. And Mm -hmm. the people at Nicaea said, Heavens, no, God forbid. There's no such thing as a time when the Son of God did not exist. He is eternal, just like God the Father. He came from the Father because he's God from God, light from light, true God from true God, but he's also eternal. Um, And that's the central claim of the Nicene Creed about Christ. Mm -hmm. To understand that, you need to understand how this word begotten is both an ordinary English word, you know, 300 years ago, and being used in a very extraordinary way by the creed. Yeah. So, uh, to, I don't know, in, in my mind, it's almost this layering of vocab then, mm-hmm. where you're, uh, this use of very ordinary words, but pulled apart on their own, we right. can get ourselves into hot water, right? right. We need kind of the, right. whole, the whole thing. Yes. There's a lot of layering. There's an enormous yeah. amount of layering. Um and, and so understanding the history of these words is really very helpful. Um, and that's yeah. why the book spends a lot of time on the, on the words. Yeah. 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 You do an amazing job of, I think, diving into um, those words and their scriptural significance, if there is one, um, mm-hmm. as well as their, I think you talk, I mean, you talk at least in one chapter, if not more about analogy and metaphor and where uh, that can fall short, Yes, uh, which is important to to mention i think this is probably getting to the same point but um why do we why as christians should we use that type of language Uh, analogy and metaphor uh while knowing it's going to fall short is because we we should use it right like it's not it's important that we right so we're able to use that we don't actually have it's not terribly important to use the word analogy okay but we, we do speak of God the Father and God the Son, right? Yeah. And, and that immediately suggests an analogy. And so when we think about it, we're going to be thinking uh, analogously, using an analogy, mm-hmm. even if we don't use the word analogy, right? Mm-hmm. Because in some way, a human father and son are like God the Father and God the Son. Mm-hmm. Distantly, very distantly, right? We, I've already spoken about how they, they're not the same, right? Because mm-hmm. I existed yeah. before my son. God the Father did not exist before God the Son. Um, so we have an analogy that is also a likeness, right? But the likeness kind of goes one way and not the other. Mm. Fathers and okay. sons on earth are a little bit, tiny little bit like God the Father and God the Son. But God is not like anything on earth, yeah. right? The likeness goes one way, right? Yeah. It's a little bit like, <laughs> to use another analogy, like your, your image in a mirror, right? Your image in a mirror looks a bit like you. Mm-hmm. Are you like your image in a mirror? Well, not really. No. Right? Yeah. You're not like the image. The image is like you. So we're made in the image of God. We should expect that the, oh, we're made in the image and likeness of God. We should expect that there is some likeness. But the likeness is really g- goes one way and not the other. Mm-hmm. And that means all likeness to God by any creature on earth or in heaven falls short of the glory of God. Right? Mm-hmm. Always, always, always. None of us uh, is a true, full, equal image of God right. other than the Son of God himself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, there's a little bit of controversy with the Nicene Creed historically. Mm-hmm. And you talk uh, about the differences between um, the Orthodox or Eastern right. version of the Creed and the Catholic, Protestant, or Western right. version of the right. creed. Um, and you mentioned three differences. Could you, I know that one difference is going to 
<laughs> take a while to right. talk about. But could you kind of go through those those three and maybe we talk about the one right. big one a little bit? Right. So let me get this right. Uh, there's a there's a really trivial difference, which it's nice when the differences are trivial. And then there's a really um, profound difference. Um, let me start just by, by mentioning um, the Eastern Orthodox, you know, capital O, um, basically originated from the eastern side of the Mediterranean, where they were all speaking Greek. Okay. And some of them this were speaking helpful. Syriac, but, but mostly yeah. speaking Greek. And the Protestants and Catholics are both Western Christians mm -hmm. uh, coming from, you know, the Western side of, of the Mediterranean, Italy and, and Spain and, and North Africa. So um, part of it is, is that the Nicene Creed originated in Greek in the eastern side of the empire near Constantinople, which was the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. And then it got translated very quickly into Latin. And then these two versions of the creed had, had separate histories. Mm. And unfortunately, the history got to be two separate. Um, so let's talk about um, uh, the, the three differences. One of them is very trivial. Um, in the West, we say in the, in the Nicene Creed, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Hmm. Turns out the Eastern Orthodox only say light from light, true God from true God. But that's really not a difference, right? And it turns out yeah. God from God came from the Council of Nicaea and true God from true God came from the Council of Constantinople about 50 years later. And you can okay. use them both or use just one. It's fine. Nobody's going to fight over that. Yeah. Um, so it just sounds a little bit different. I, the first time I heard the Eastern Orthodox reciting the creed in English, I thought, what? You left something out. <laughs> but it's trivial. The, there's a, a more interesting difference. That's the second difference. Um, the Eastern Orthodox will always say, we believe. Mm -hmm. In the Western churches, it used to be, I believe. Nowadays, some mm -hmm. Western churches will say, we believe. Um, it's an interesting difference. Um, in part because the, the Latin creed was translated credo, I believe. Mm -hmm. The Eastern creed was always we believe. And there's a reason for that. The, the Eastern creed originates in a council, a council of bishops. So the council of bishops is agreeing about what they believe and teach. Yeah, and the okay. bishops are saying, this is what we believe. Confess mm -hmm. the faith with us. We believe. Yeah. The, e, uh, the West, rather, pardon me, the West is used to the Apostles' Creed because the Apostles' Creed arose in the West, right. in Rome, and, and the West is thinking of baptismal creeds. And in yeah. a baptismal creed, you say, I believe. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and that's why um, the Apostles' Creed in particular, which is a favorite creed in the West, um, you, you say, I believe. But the difference is not uh, particularly uh, great, and it it's not because the West is somehow individualistic or something, right? Mm. When you recite the baptismal creed, you're basically pledging allegiance to the church of Christ and saying, I belong to the body of Christ. Yeah. Uh, I'm now a Christian. I, I'm now suitable for martyrdom. <laughs> and in some places in the world, when you get baptized, you are about to be martyred, right? Yeah. There are yeah. places in the world when you get baptized, you got to hide because they'll, they'll mm -hmm. kill you. So saying, I believe is, is pledging allegiance to this, this army of Christ where, you don't kill, but you might die. Yeah. So that's a difference, but it's not um, a difference in substance. It's not a difference in the faith. Yeah. Um, and more a style style difference almost, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's a historical difference. And nowadays, yeah. a lot of Western churches are saying we believe. So okay. right, we can adjust to that, right? Yeah. Um, you can say it either way. The Eastern Orthodox tend to be picky. They really want to say we believe, but that's okay. We can say it that yeah. way. The other difference, the third difference. Oh, dear. That's a big one. That's a big one. And it's tragic. Yeah. So what happens is um, the, the Western Creed, which is in Latin, goes through um, some one crucial change. Probably in Spain, where they were speaking Latin in the seventh century, they started adding the phrase and the son to the confession about the Holy Spirit. So. Yes. What the creed says about the Holy Spirit in Greek it translates as, um, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life who proceeds from the Father. Now, the language about the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father is, is right there in the Gospel of John. Mm -hmm. um, so that's good and biblical. 
But in the West, we ended up adding this phrase and the spirit, uh, sorry, and the, and the son. And the son. So, so we say that he proceeds from the father and the son. Mm-hmm. You'll hear this described as the filioque, uh, F-I-L-I-O-Q-U-E, which is a Latin word meaning and the son. Mm-hmm. So that one word got added to the creed in the Western tradition. It's, a, it's the phrase um, and, the, and the son in you know, three words in English. And the West ended up insisting on this. The East said, wait a minute, you don't have a right to add this to the creed without our consent, right? The, the, the Nicene Creed is meant to be an ecumenical creed that is a creed for the whole church, which means mm. it needs to be ratified by an ecumenical council, which is a council of the whole church. And you Mm. guys in the West don't have a right to to add this to the creed without us. And the reason why it's picky and and, and sticky is that when you recite the creed, you're saying this is the Christian faith. This is what's essential to Christian faith. And the Eastern Orthodox are saying this stuff about the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son is not necessary to the Christian faith. You don't have a right to, to make it necessary to the Christian faith, right? Not without an ecumenical council, you don't. And my own view as a Western Christian is that the Eastern Orthodox are right about that. You know, on okay. procedural grounds, they're right. We shouldn't have added this. Hmm. Now, I don't think that adding this makes it heretical or something. I think there's, yeah. I think it's actually true that, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Yeah. But it's not necessary to the faith to say so. So we Westerners really just ought to drop it from the creed. Hmm. And in fact, when I recite the creed, which I do every Sunday, I don't Mm -hmm. say it. I Hmm. I don't say that part of it because I I don't think we should be letting this one Latin word divide the church. Um, Yeah. So I think we should just say, yeah, you guys in the East, you're right about that. Sorry, let's drop this. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, if I was the Pope, then saying this would make more difference. Um, I'm just some philosophy professor outside Philadelphia, and <laughs> my view of this, which is actually fairly common, um, nonetheless, is not going to make the difference. Yeah, yeah, that's but, really interesting. I because I, you know, I learned about this in school a few years ago, and I actually um, would say the way that the way I was taught it it was opposite that the West was right. And that this should have been in it, um, that there's scriptural basis for it. And, um, so I, I appreciate your, your perspective on it because there is something tragic about, I mean, this did correct me if I'm wrong, but this did play a little part in the great schism eventually, right? Like this was a a major reason why the church was split. (laughs) Yeah, I'm not sure it's it's what really drove the split, but it yeah. was certainly okay. used as the excuse. Yeah. Okay, interesting. I think if if the Eastern and Western Christians were in charity with one another, they'd have been able yeah. to work this out. But yeah. but I think people were cruising for a bruising, right? They Our, were ready yeah. to break up. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I say, I do think that um, it's prob- you know, properly understood that it's true to say that the son, that the Holy Spirit yes. proceeded from the father and the son. I think mm-hmm. Augustine's argument for this, and it's Augustine who's the person who makes this argument in the West. I think Augustine's argument for this is sound, mm-hmm. but I don't think it should be required as you have to believe this in order to be a Christian. Um, yeah. Whereas you do have to believe that the, the spirit proceeds from the father because it's right there in the Bible. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, it's an interesting example of, not getting too specific sometimes yeah. when we we come to a, a confession of faith whereas it's this fine i feel like it's this fine line between we have to be specific enough right. to not fall into heresy but we also don't right. want to so it's really people. a matter of drawing a line right sometimes yeah. you have to draw a line and it's a boundary and there are people who are outside the boundary mm-hmm. and, and the nicene creed was meant to draw a line and say arius you're outside the bounds of the faith Unless yeah. you repent and and come confess this same faith with us, you're outside, and mm. and you they actually excommunicated him, right? But I don't think we should be excommunicating people over this one word addition in the West, right? Yeah, that, that sh- that's not the right place to draw the line. So yeah. I think it's it's a matter of wisdom to know where to draw the line, yeah. because sometimes lines have to be drawn, but drawing them in the wrong place creates division where there doesn't have to be. <laughs>
Yeah. Where would you say is, is there a place where that line is drawn? Um, is, does it depend on the situation or like, how do we know as, as, as Christians, when to, when to do that, when to draw the line? Well, part of it is that, um, the line should be drawn not by an individual Christian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The most important lines have been drawn by ecumenical councils where, where the church gets together and, and East and West and agrees about, about things. Um, and typically you don't end up drawing a line very clearly until you get a new challenge and you say, Oh, we haven't really thought about that yet. Right. Mm. So, What happened with Arius, for example, is that Arius was focusing on this notion of of the son being begotten from the father, which which is biblical language, right? The Mm -hmm. only begotten son. And Arius says, oh, yeah, that means that that first there was the father and then there was the son, right? And a lot of Christians had been imagining it that way. But then they thought, wait a minute, if the son didn't exist for a while, if he came out of nothing, if he was one of the things that God created, then worshiping the son would be idolatry. Mm-hmm. And we've been worshiping Jesus Christ at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, ever since the apostles taught us the faith. Mm-hmm. So we better draw a line here and say, if you're not confessing that the son is eternal, and that he's just as eternal and truly God is God, the father, mm-hmm. then you're making us Christians into pagans and idolaters. No good. You've got to join us in confessing the faith that Jesus is eternally begotten of the Father before all the ages, right? Mm, Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's a helpful example to say we're not just drawing lines all over the place. It's when something arises, an issue arises, we have to to work through it. All of a sudden you realize, okay, we really need clarity on this particular issue. Yeah. In one chapter, you talk about um, the fundamental way that scripture testifies to Jesus. I think this is a quote from you, actually. You say the fundamental way that scripture testifies to us that Jesus is one in the same God as the father is by naming him as Lord. Uh, yeah. um, can you talk a little bit about the biblical meaning of this, this name and the significance um, in Jesus being named Lord? Right. right. So, um, I think that what the Nicene Creed is teaching goes straight back to the very foundation of Christian faith, which actually is in in Christian worship, where we're we're worshiping Jesus at the right hand of God, the Father, which is to say this man, Jesus, is sitting on the throne of God, Hmm. right? How is that possible? Well, that's because Jesus is Lord. And Lord turns out to be a way of referring to the name of the God of Israel. Hmm. Um, So remember in in Romans 10, right? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you you have salvation. Mm -hmm. Well, what does it mean to confess that Jesus is Lord? Um, Well, it turns out that the word Lord is used throughout the the Old Testament. Well, this gets complicated. It's used throughout the Old Testament translations in place of the name of God. Yeah. Because... At the time of the New Testament, at the time of of Jesus and the disciples um, uh, walking on earth, um, Jews did not say the name of God. They said Lord instead. In Hebrew, it was Adonai. In Greek, it's Mm -hmm. Kyrios, as in Kyrie Eleison, uh, which is right there in in the the liturgies and such. Um, The the Hebrew name for God is uh, typically transliterated into English as YHWH. Mm-hmm. If you're Jewish, you never try to say that name. Right? Yeah. You don't even know what the vowels are. In fact, to this day, we're not really sure what the vowels are supposed to be in that name. There are Christians who like to say that name. Uh, I myself do not. I think we okay. should. Okay. Yeah. Right. You, I picked up on that in your chapter. And that's why that's one of the reasons I'm asking right, you a little bit right. about it. Yeah. Right. So I think if if we respect our Jewish brothers and sisters, we don't say the name. And also, I think Jesus is picking up on this and telling us to, instead of calling God by name, using the name of God in the Old Testament, how do you pray? How do you call upon the name of the Lord without saying his name? You say, our father. 
who art in heaven. Mm. That's how you pray, right? I think his disciples, when they came to Jesus and asked how to pray, they were asking, how do you call upon the name of the Lord without saying the name? And, mm. and Jesus' answer is, say our Father, who art in heaven. And that's why the word Father ends up being almost glued to the, the word God, right? We talk about, right. when we talk about God, we're mostly talking about the Father. Mm-hmm. When we talk about the Lord, we're mostly talking about Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so um, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, right? Well, th- that's Romans 10. A few verses later, um, Paul quotes uh, Joel saying, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now that's Joel talking about the Lord God of Israel. Mm-hmm. Um, and Paul is saying that's the Lord Jesus. So yeah. Jesus has the name Lord, which is the name of the God of Israel. Yeah. So the Christian way of saying Jesus is God is Jesus is Lord. Mm. It's often been pointed out, right? The Bible doesn't say Jesus is God. No, it says Jesus is Lord, which is the most emphatic way you could possibly say in a Jewish yeah. context that Jesus is God. The yeah. name of the Lord God of Israel belongs to Jesus. Just yeah. like this man sits on the right hand of God, right? On the throne mm-hmm. of God, right? The picture of Jesus sitting on the throne of God is saying the same thing as a confession that Jesus is Lord. So yeah. j- just to fill in a gap here in, in, in that the people probably don't know, um, if you're Jewish and you're reading the scriptures aloud, which is the primary act of worship in the synagogue is to read mm-hmm. the Hebrew Bible aloud. What happens when, when you come to the name of God and you're not supposed to say it? You don't say the name. You say Adonai instead, which is Hebrew for Lord. Mm -hmm. And this is why in most Bible translations, when you get to the name Lord in the Old Testament, it's usually Lord with four capital letters, you might notice. Right. Mm -hmm. That's standing in for the name that is never said. The unsayable name of God. It's kind of like uh, in Harry Potter referring to Voldemort as he who must not be named, right? Is that kind of similar? It's a little bit like that, except this is um, a, a name that is too good and holy to be said. Yes, not too evil and right. disdained. Right. Yes, opposite context. Right. And and you do have a word for it. You you, you say Adonai, you say... Um, yes. If you're, Hebrew, if you're Jewish, you often say Hashem, which means the name. Okay. Um, and and the, the point is that you don't say the name, but you say this word Lord... And then it gets translated as Lord into English. And, you know, when you're reading uh, the Bible, it's actually important to notice when God says, I am the Lord all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. And he says, I am the Lord. That is my name in Isaiah. Right. Or in Exodus, he, he, he passes by Moses and says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and long suffering and and full of of grace. Um, the, The word Lord there, he's not saying I'm the boss. He's saying, that's my name. Right? Mm, and okay. so when Christians come and say Jesus is Lord, they're actually saying the name of the Lord God of Israel, the creator of heaven and earth, rightly belongs to this man who's sitting on the throne of God. Yeah. Which is, you know, only Christians will say that, right? That's that's right. that's either crazy or it's the most important truth in the universe. Right? Yes. Yeah. It's a big, it's the biggest claim yes, that we can that's make. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I that was just such a fascinating chapter, um, and the connections are are so amazing. So thank you for yeah. kind of spelling that out here and as well in in the book. Um, let's see, I, I have so many questions. I feel like we could <laughs> we could spend hours on um, on all of this stuff. One other thing I think that stuck out to me is you also mention that both the Cre- the Nicene Creed and the early church fathers avoided the phrase becoming incarnate uh, yeah. in favor of phrasing that was more along the lines of uh, Jesus Christ assumed, I think, incarnation or they uh, or yeah. was, yeah, in, maybe it's not incarnation, assumed, how would is, you say he, it? In Greek, it almost translates, if you translate it really hyper literally as he was fleshified. He was fleshified. He was yes, fleshified. that's perfect. Right. In, in Latin, it's more like he was incarnate. Um, okay. Uh, when you think incarnate, think chili con carne, um, carnivore, yes. flesh, right? Yeah. Um, Jesus had flesh that's as real as our flesh and could become a meal for a carnivore, just like our flesh could be, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, well, the fleshified thing, the point about that is that um, the church fathers who composed the creed and taught it, 
did not think that God changed when he became human. So they avoided the language of becoming human. Right. Um, and they, well, one of the church fathers has this wonderful phrase. Um, he remained what he was. That is Jesus, the eternal son of God, remains what he was, but he assumes what he was not. That is, he, he takes it and makes it his own. So okay. the eternal son of God, who has always existed, assumes and takes up and makes his own our humanity. And it's because he makes our humanity his own that he can die. He makes mm -hmm. our mortality his own. Um, he makes our birth his own. All of this he makes his own. He didn't have to become human. He didn't have to make this his own. And he didn't change into something other than God. That's yeah. why that, it's really important, right? That's why he's true God right. and true man. The yeah. true God assumed our humanity and made it his own without ceasing to be God. Uh, without ceasing to be God, he became as truly human as we are. And thus he became true God and true man. Um, okay. Another way of putting this that, that um, one of the church fathers noticed about the creed is it's really like it's as if he was born in two different ways. First, in eternity, he was begotten from the Father before all ages. But then in time, right, he was um, born of the Virgin Mary, mm, right? Okay. His human nature didn't exist before Mary. Yeah. But his divine nature has always existed. Okay. So those are the two births, a birth in eternity and a birth in time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and really the is what what they're trying to avoid is this idea that Jesus is something other than God, right? right? That his his substance or his being is something less than or right. or more than or whatever <laughs> right. way you're going to go. I don't know if right. it could be more than, but right. you, can, um, you can think of him as as adding something to his divine being. But what he okay. adds to his divine being is our humanity, and that's something less than his divine being, right? He takes yes. up what is less than himself. Yeah, okay. Right? Remaining what he was, which is God, he takes up what he was not, which is our mortal suffering humanity, and he makes that his own. Um, so you can say it's kind of like a come down for God to become one of us. And that's why the creed uses the language of descent, right? It's not like God, who is omnipresent after all, kind of moved from one place to another. Right? Mm. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. Yeah. But he took up what is ours and made it his own. And that's a real come down. That's the mm -hmm. lowliness and humility of God who's willing to take up our humanity and become flesh, become, you know, like a piece of meat that a carnivore could eat. Right. Yeah. He, he's yeah. willing to do that. That's his descent. Yeah. which is not a movement in space and it's not a change in God, but it's an, an addition of what is less than God to God's own being. Okay. That's the descent. I think that language is, is helpful. Yeah. Uh, at least to me. Yeah. That's, the creed yeah. uses that language of descent, but, but right. you can't take it as, as if he's moving around from a, a high place to a low place because right. Right. It's not like he's descending like rain from the sky. Right. Um, he's descending in the sense that, that God is, humiliating himself being yeah. humbling himself to take up you know take up space in a woman's womb uh, be, take flesh like us with our needs and indeed be willing to die for us um and suffer uh which which god never had to do i mean yeah this is one of the most fascinating things in some deep way god is more human than we are because yeah. we didn't we never chose to be human we mm -hmm. never chose to be born we never chose to be mortal we never chose to be the kind of being that's vulnerable to suffering and death. And God, out of love for us, chose all those things. Yeah. And the creed is saying that, which is the lovely yeah. thing to say. Yeah. Yeah. And he's that makes me think of that he's the first fruit of the first fruits of the resurrection. Right. Which um I was gonna ask, you know, the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed both end with this confession um of the resurrection right. of the dead or the right. resurrection of the body. And life of the age to come. Right. Um, and we talked a little bit about this at the beginning, but why, why do you think that's an important place to end an important uh, addition for how we understand who, who Christ is? Right. Yeah. It, it turns out the, the, the creed tends to work from beginning to end, right? Yeah. The beginning is the eternal being of God, the eternal son of God begotten from the father. 
And then he's born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, dead, and buried. He's raised from the dead. But that's all in the past. Where is Jesus now? He's yeah. sitting at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. But is that going to be, is that the end of the story? Well, no, he's coming again in glory to judge the living and the dead. So he will be revealed once again in flesh, right? But, but no longer in his humility and vulnerability, but in glory. And what happens then? In him, we are glorified, right? His kingdom has no end. We become members of his kingdom, just as we are members of his body. We are resurrected in a resurrection like his, right? We have new spiritual bodies like his body. Um, death itself is defeated, right? Because it's not just, you know, immortal souls, right? It's not like, oh, we escaped from the body and we're, we we have immortal souls. Right. Rather, yeah. this mortal body is clothed with immortality, right? The mortal yeah. puts on immortality, the corruptible, perishable body puts on incorruption and imperishability. Where, how do, how do we get this immortality and incorruptibility? We get it from Christ himself. We are clothed yeah. in Christ, his immortality, his incorruptibility, his eternal life. And that's the future. Mm -hmm. So the, the creed moves from past, present to future, or from the beginning of all things to the end of yeah. all things. And the end of all things is the kingdom of God in which, well, the, the angels sing it in the book of Revelation. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he mm -hmm. shall reign forever. And we reign with him in life, yeah. as Paul says. So that's where the creed lands at the end is in this, this sure confidence and hope in, in the resurrection of the dead and the kingdom of God. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think there's been quite a bit in at least the last decade, if not last couple of de decades, about Christians really not understanding Trinitarian uh, doctrine. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, I mean, I don't feel like <laughs> I, I am in theology as my career. And I feel like I sometimes have to check myself, don't understand it. And um, it's kind of this, I feel this tension between wanting to understand um, more about mm -hmm. uh, the Trinity and also being terrified that I don't understand or if I can, or I might confuse something. And so right. then not saying anything at all. And you kind of, I think your epilogue does a great job of just mm. laying out for the, ah, yeah. the lay Christian, this very simple way of understanding the Trinity. Could you kind of talk a little bit right. about what that right. is? Just, I think it's a helpful way um, to give people words to understand the Trinity great. when we great. feel very anxious about it. Right. I mean, the Nicene Creed is meant to, to teach us the doctrine of the Trinity, but yeah. there's a kind of logical bare bones that's right there in the, in, the, in the Creed, and you can really turn it into, well, you can reduce it to logical bare bones, then you want to put flesh on it. But, but the logical yeah. bare bones you can learn very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, this is something I learned from Augustine, so I didn't make this up. Um, but uh, I think you can teach it in about two minutes. Okay. Uh, it's seven statements, right? Okay. First, you have a trio of statements about who God is. The Father mm -hmm. is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Mm -hmm. Okay, then you have a trio of statements, three statements that distinguish these three persons who are God. The Father okay. is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, then loop back around to the Father. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. Okay, so let's review. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Father. Seventh statement, how many gods are there? Just one. One, yeah. Okay, so to review, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit Holy is God. The Spirit is God. Right. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy the Spirit. And then oh. looping back around to the beginning, the Holy Spirit yeah. is not the Father. Yeah. And there's one God. Okay. That's the basic logical bare bones. You, you have to put flesh on that before you get the, the full Christian faith. But mm -hmm. that's the lo logical bare bones. Notice it doesn't ever use the word Trinity, doesn't yeah. ever use the word three, right? Mm -hmm. You can be a perfectly good Trinitarian Christian and never even have heard that God is three in one or mm -hmm. that God is three persons. That's useful language, but you don't need it. What you yeah. need is the name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
by the way, that's not an analogy, right? That's a name. It suggests an analogy between you know father and son. Um, and there's other analogies like God and his word. That's a, another good analogy, different kind of analogy. All of these analogies are inadequate. The crucial thing is the name, right? Mm. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Father's God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. You need the word God. You need the word one. You need the name. That's all you need. Yeah. You don't need fancy language to get the logical bare bones. Yeah. Um, and then you need to learn the creed. Then you need to learn the gospel. Then you need to learn your scripture. But yeah. um, what, what I'm saying is that this logical bare bones will turn out to be the basic logical structure of the story of the gospel in, in scripture uh, as yeah. summarized by the creed. Yeah. 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 It's a good, a good checkpoint, I think, to, to check in back in on when, when we're studying these types of things and kind of get right. in our head about them. So that's, right. that's very helpful. Um, well, I think, you know, our time is coming to an end. If there was one thing that you could choose to give just the average typical Christian about the Nicene Creed, what would you, what would you want to leave them with? Uh huh. What I want to leave them with is you worship Jesus, don't you, you Christians? Mm. Right? This is what nobody else does. Right? You worship him, this man, and you worship him as God. What's going on when you do that? If you want to bear witness about what you're doing when you worship this man on the throne of God, you'll need to learn the Nicene Creed. So go hmm. to it. But meanwhile, <laughs> keep worshiping Jesus because he's That's Lord. great. Yeah. That's great. Well, I appreciate um, your time so much. Thanks so much for chatting today. I know I learned a lot, so I think people okay. who listen are going to gonna take a lot from what you said. And I hope everyone picks up the book. It really is a very accessible look at the Nicene Creed. So I enjoyed it. All right, good. If you enjoy Outside Ourselves, there's a couple of really easy ways that you can support the show. You could share some of your favorite episodes, either on social media or with friends and family. You could also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, just search Outside Ourselves, subscribe. That way you get all of the content that I am releasing on a consistent basis. Thanks so much for listening and for watching. I'll see you back here in a couple of weeks.